Okay, so Christian Herger with Red Hat and Corentin Noel with Calabra are going to talk about Builder. All right, so um, I'm not really one that's big on plan talks, so this is mostly off the cuff because this is like the one, this is the one talk we do a year. So um, first off, I want to say thank you to everyone that has contributed to Builder in some way over the last few years. Uh, it's, for me, it's been really the highlight of my career to be able to focus on this. So um, just being here and seeing people use stuff, when I like peek around the corner and I see you using it, like that means a lot to me. So uh, we've been really busy in the last year. And uh, in particular, um, as we try to make Builder a professional tool, uh, especially in this world of containers, we run into some really interesting challenges. Uh, in the last year, uh, I had to put together a PTY system that was me like learning how all of this like infrastructure works underneath us. And it was necessary because uh, a lot of people have interesting build systems that will, uh, they expect input or something weird and want to be able to use a terminal and be able to control C and have color highlighting, but we also need to be able to extract errors and all of that. So it was just one of these, uh, you know, weekends where you just geek out on how something works. Um, and uh, you'll see it in a minute, I guess. But just kind of some highlights from the years. PTY system, we landed a debugger right after Guadic last year. I worked on a new uh, layer for us to do device integration for phones and tablets, and uh, hopefully soon some IoT and Corentin also helped with that. So uh, he'll have some demos for that. Uh, spent some time moving Clang out of process because people were complaining about memory usage and stuff, and having a compiler in process is a pretty difficult thing. Uh, we did a big push for the newcomers in, uh, initiative, and uh, I think we've landed some really cool features that people are already using there to make, uh, make it really easy to contribute. And we have a bunch of new Git support, drag and drop, a uh, new threading engine. I wrote some blog posts on most of this. So if you follow on Planet Gnome, none of this will be super new, but we have a couple tricks in store for you. Uh, spent some time on language server protocol. So those that use Rust, are, it's a really common thing. The RLS uh, Rust language server we have decent support for. Tons of bug fixes a new really cool auto-completion engine that we just landed last month. Uh, hopefully we'll demo, demo that today as well. You can see that. And uh, multi-touch gestures. Uh, and then what I think is really cool is some new sysprof stuff that we have coming in the pipeline that'll help people do performance tuning all the way from the compositor and graphics driver events all the way up through helping you figure out what in your application is causing uh, drawing stalls in GTK. So first off, the PTY interceptor. Uh, this guy here is uh, able to extract errors as they come across your terminal, even though that terminal really has nothing to do with Builder. It's just this uh, pseudo terminal uh, from point to point, and we've interjected ourselves in the middle to extract errors, and that ho that's how we fill the uh, the build warnings that you see here on the side. Uh, not exactly something you think about having to be a very complex thing, but it is a significant amount of uh, engineering to make that work. Those that have used the debugger are probably familiar with this. Uh, we have the line changes we get from Git. We have the debugger uh, breakpoints, and we have errors that are coming from uh, the diagnostics engine. And traditionally, with GTK source view, each of those you could think of as a column, and you pack them in like you might with a GTK box. And that becomes complicated when you keep adding features to your system, because it keeps getting wider and wider. And the wider you take for that, the less space you have for code. So. Uh, we came up with a, a clever trick here to get everything combined into one renderer and get that density down so that you don't lose a ton of, uh, of real estate in the process. Those that have followed the Newcomers Initiative, uh, we've made it really, really simple. When you start up Builder, you can just click on the application that you're interested in. And in the process of that, it will 
clone the repository, download all the dependencies, build the dependencies, and all you have to do is click on an icon and then click run, and you can be off in patching whatever application you want to work on. What's really cool about this is it, uh, it, it uses the same infrastructure that we demoed last year with the screen turning around and Builder being on the backside of your application. And uh, I expect with some of the work that's going on at Endless now that maybe by like GNOME 332, we can have that in our upstream platform. So we'll have this really cool developer experience where if you want to go and transform an application on GNOME, it's just a couple key presses and the window flips around and you can start hacking on it and then flip it back around and see your changes immediately, which I think is a really cool uh, ethos in terms of GNOME being a platform for people to change and make it what they want it to be. Continually, we got asked for drag and drop stuff, so I finally bit the bullet and implemented it here in the sidebar. Uh, it's a lot more work than you would think because we have to implement moving files, which potentially deletes files. And if you are not super careful, you delete people's data. So uh, I was really hesitant to do that for a while because I really, the last thing I want is someone to file a bug report that's like, hey, you just deleted like, I don't know, a week's worth of work, <laughs> and now I can't get it back. And that would make me feel really, really bad. We also now provide live status of what Git tells us our changes, and we've, we do the best that we can to monitor your project directory for changes. This is actually impossible to do correctly on Linux. Uh, I notify is this thing we've been using to do file system changes forever, but it doesn't provide any correctness. You can lose events, so it's a best effort, but in general, it's pretty good. This is one of my favorites. You can use, uh, for those that are using a touchpad, you can use three finger slide gestures and move the panes around. Uh, I don't know why it's so fun, but it's, it's very tactile and interactive, so I don't know, I do it a lot. Here we have the new, com the new completion engine. This is what I spent the last month mostly working on. And uh, previously with GTK Source View, it's worked really well for us so far. But the, the design of all of these completion providers we get from like Python or Clang or Rust, they, they're, designed in a, they're designed in a way that's intended to be client-side filtering. So you say, hey, what can I do at this position of my cursor? And it gives you a list back of, say, like 25,000 possibilities in the case of C. So we needed to start being really careful with how much memory we allocated, how many objects we we create, how much text we size to display uh, the result set. And we've gotten this now to what I think is, a, is close to an ideal. Uh, so much that we can now enable the Clang auto-completion by default, and it's super fast. I, I actually think everybody should download Builder Nightly and give this a shot, because it's, uh, it's so good now that like I don't even I don't even think about it. Before, I would be like, oh, crap, I'm using this, and it's like slowing me down more than it's helping me. So I'm pretty excited to see this land in our, uh, our real release. About a month or two ago, we had the Shell Performance Hack Fest, and we had kind of sat down and started thinking about how we can start doing more tuning uh, of our system. So here is just a, a quick screen cap of uh, on the top there is a row of CPU performance data. The next row is the frames per second as rendered from a GTK application. So we've gone in and we get that data out of GTK. And then on the, uh, the final one are counters of the frame clock inside of GTK. So it's like, when did it start processing events? When did it uh, start resizing widgets? When did it finish calculating CSS, et cetera? Uh, and when did that data actually get to the screen. So not a lot of tooltip data yet. That, like I said, this is a very early prototype, but uh, using some of these tools together, especially with the new JavaScript profiler in GJS, with uh, getting data out of the shell as well. Like we'll, we'll have some of the same data come from Mutter. We just don't have a screenshot of that yet. You'll be able to say, okay, like 
did the shell stall, and that's why I didn't see my data? Did GTK stall, and that's why I didn't see my data? Or did my application block the main loop so this stuff didn't happen? It will be fairly obvious what's going on. In my process of doing a bunch of uh, debugging this year, I realized that we have a very important thing to fix in GTask. And basically, if we have any, if anybody's in here is a maintainer of a project and you're using GTask and you're using GTK widgets together, there's a strong possibility you have a correctness issue. And in particular, if you're using threading at all. If you're not using threading, it's probably fine. But if you are ever calling gtask run in thread, there is a strong possibility you can get a race condition where your GTK widget or your task data is freed on a thread. GTK widgets are not thread safe. They expect things to be only referenced and unreferenced in the main thread. And for us, that caused some particularly difficult to debug uh, crashes. So we built a new task engine for Builder to get around this and uh, backport it into our stable branch uh, while we figure out how to fix GTask correctly. And, uh, but it, in the process, it's given us a bunch of debugging tools and uh, has cleaned up a significant number of hard to debug crashes for us. This one will land soon. This is a new tooltip engine we have. And, uh, each of these can be provided by a different plugin. So at the top here, you see the symbol provider plugin, and it's resolved what symbol was under the cursor. It provides you some location of where that data is defined, declarations versus definitions. The debugger allows you to attach breakpoints and count points. If you're not familiar with count points, it's a breakpoint that will not stop. So you, every time you hit your breakpoint, you get a counter. So it's really useful in the situations where you need to just see, like, how much is this code being hit? And hit. You can just set a count point, and then in the uh, debugger breakpoint view, it'll tell you how much is going on. And now, let's see here. I think I want to jump ahead one slide first. So uh, earlier in the year, we found out that the Librem folks, or the Purism folks, are working on the Librem phone. And we wanted to ensure that we could provide an experience this summer where you could start writing applications in Builder and be able to push and deploy to a phone and uh, test it locally. And we've gotten a pretty, pretty decent uh, amount of work done on this. We have a new daemon called Device D that will run on a device. It can run on a, on a second laptop. It can run on a tablet, a phone, et cetera and it manages the integration points we need on that device. Uh, this was a, a very fast collaboration work between myself, Patrick Griffiths, and Corentin, and we have a secure connection over Wi-Fi on the local network. We're gonna have USB support soon. We have uh, the ability currently to only install flat packs, but the application managers of how you push applications to it is abstracted, so there's it's perfectly reasonable to support other things like tarballs, et cetera, snap, and whatnot. Uh, it's built on top of a JSON R RPC, so if you want to write your own custom tooling, it's really easy. You can use Python and a couple lines of code to control it. And then we have a library for tools that want to use it, and it's a service-oriented design so that we can abstract more than just communicating to device D. My anticipation is that we can use this from Builder and have one device abstraction and builder rather than like abstractions of abstractions. And I, I would like to see us abstract uh, like lib iMobile device or like some of the Android device stuff in there as well. Let's see here, and then I will do one more. So this is a quick demo of using some of the infrastructure that we have. Uh, you probably can't read the text very well on here, but what just happened is this is a, an x86 machine compiling for ARM64 and running on an x86 device. So that allows us to actually start experimenting with the new Librem device without having a Librem device at all. You can uh, ensure that your code works with ARM. So just here as a quick intro, uh, 
We've also been working on cross-compiling. That right there was a native compiler that was emulating, taking an ARM compiler written for ARM and executing it on x86 using QE moves, uh, combination of binary translation and syscall translation. That is not exactly a fast way to compile software, but it does work. So uh, Quarantana has been working on uh, cross-compiling stuff and toolchain and sysroot support. So with that, I will hand it off to him to start going over. Oh, is it going to let me? LibreOffice has fooled me. Let's see if we can get this. All right, so no let's build a GTK Plus application for a MIDI device. Uh, as you've seen, uh, the video that you've seen is uh, made using Flatpak, uh, cross-compiling um, inside QMU. Um, but now, I, when people want to, to build a GTK Plus application for a MIDI device, uh, it's, we have a few problems because uh, it's very easy when you compare to Android and you just have to download an SDK and it just all works out of the box. And uh, the same for iOS. Uh, for uh, no application, there is just no way to uh, have an SDK and just compile it using your laptop directly on the embedded device. Um, so yeah, there is just no tool, actually. Um, so there is, of course, the GNOME Builder solution. Um, I've been working on adding um, so native uh, cross-compiling um, to different ar architecture. And for now, the SDK is just um, a sysroot, so a copy of the root file system of the embedded device. Um, so in the future, you will be able to just clone, build, test, and deploy just with one click. Um, so um, what what I've uh, it, what I've done is um, I've just first started using a share root uh, to get a, just a sys root that works. Um, it builder now has um, an interface that I will show you uh, after uh, to just define the um, cross compiler and just define a sys root. So you will be able to just use uh, the cross compiler that comes with your distribution and build an application. So. Uh, how is it working um, under, under the hood is uh, that I just extended uh, the Mizen support, the CMake support, to uh, be able to cross-compile. Um, so I naturally made Mizen a first-class citizen here because uh, it covers a lot of, uh, a lot of corner case very easily, um, and um, Builder now is able to create a Mizen cross compiler file uh, just with uh, GUI, and um, it's also able to uh, read a CMake cross compiling file and can just read a CMake cross compiling file and create a Mizen cross compiler file and the reverse because those. Uh, covers almost the same features. Um, so yeah, uh, let me show you how it works.
You're welcome. I don't know if that was clapping for elementary or clapping because the XR and R switched. <laughs> wow, that is some. It wouldn't be a demo without X, R, and R. Did you just tell me to screw myself? <laughs> <laughs> So here it's a startup screen. I have a simple app that I know that will work. Um, so yeah, it's a simple Hello World application that is forked from uh, GTK Hello World. Um, so here you have the actual um, Mizen cross compilation file. That so I have a sysroot that is in my home directory directly under sysroot. Um, all of this is just created um, if you use the actual uh, GUI that is here under SDK. So you can just specify a sysroot and specify a tool chain. Um, here and So let's clean and uh, build the application. And there is a, a tiny bug right now that's just preventing me to run it directly. But here, directly in the command line, so there is nothing, uh, just an environment variable because I use this roots, but it will be set directly by builder uh, with when you um, click on the run button. But yeah, here it's an Arch64 application running natively with QMU. So yeah, that's how easy it will be. And um, naturally, with work on device daemon, it will be just that quick to uh, deploy it directly. So we're here. All right, so here we got another video of a demo. Uh, this is a tablet running like Fedora 27 or something. And uh, from Builder here, this is uh, building for the architecture of the remote device locally. 
and then it's, uh, this part hasn't been automated yet, but uh, it can package it as a flat pack, and then it pushes it to the remote device, and it knows what version was previously on that device. So it actually builds a static delta between the two versions if it has both. So it's a minimal file transfer to the new device. And uh, the next part, we can actually launch the app remotely, but what I don't have hooked up is uh, connecting the debugger into the remote device, because we need to set up like multiple PTYs, one to control GDB, one for the subprocess. So you get like local output and everything. Uh, the plumbing's there, uh, it's just like, connecting a few bits of pieces at the high level. What's cool about this is you can run device D on a bunch of different things. You can run it on a second laptop, you can run it on your workstation. Uh, a lot while I was working on this at home was I was just sitting on the couch and I was like remotely running and testing uh, software on a different machine. So you don't need to have like a Librem phone to demo stuff. You can just take any other machine, Raspberry Pi, et cetera. Uh, and so I hope to see this scaled down to even uh, some microcontrollers that we can have using a different API, but still using libdeviceD to, um, to control it. So we have a little bit more time, and I want to save some time for questions, but just to give you an idea of some of the challenges that we have when working on Builder, because uh, I think if you're aware of them, it might help me a little bit. So one of the most difficult things in designing an IDE is figuring out where the abstractions exist. And uh, every single piece of tooling we could try to go out and automate has its niche, the, the particular thing that it's really good at. And uh, if you're drawing uh, boxes around abstractions here to see how they fit together. None of the boxes seem to fit exactly the same, right? So we have like a sysroot for this compiling for alternate architectures versus the flat pack runtime abstraction versus compiling for a local host. They're all somewhat similar in that you have this like directory area where you have libraries and compilers and tool chains, but where they exist doesn't match up. And it's not even the same for say a linter. How do you run a linter on your source code. Well, some of them require going and finding the C flag so that you can prime Clang with everything it needs to find includes, while others you just throw it at a Python file and it figures it out. So like having these pieces in which they can, they can come together has been a huge challenge for us in minimal abstraction. Uh, to do this, we've taken a very fine-grained approach, uh, approach to plugins. That means you might have to subclass more things, but it helps us avoid the impedance mismatch from uh, unequal abstractions. Uh, and furthermore, the, anybody that's followed Hacker News or Reddit knows that there's a new JavaScript framework every week. So uh, coming up with tooling that stays relevant is an impossible task for me. So what I think of as my job in Builder is to ensure that you have the tooling to enable what you need. I, you can't rely on me to do all of that, right? So uh, if you can't do that for yourself, that's my fault, and you should definitely tell me. But if you don't have some custom language feature you need for what you're working on, I do somewhat expect you to help implement that feature. Uh, but we have had some really cool things that have happened uh, for us. We are what I would consider the first container-native IDE builder was built around this idea of uh, uh, container access to be able to build our tooling, and it's worked really well, because we're both container native in that you can install Builder on Flatpak, and there's no feature degradation. Like, we have found ways to work with the containering system to ensure that everything is there, and that's not the case with pretty much any of the other tooling. Um, but there is some, some tricky things, like debugging. When we're debugging a program from Builder that's running in Flatpak, we are running a debugger in another mount namespace that's completely foreign to us. We don't necessarily know natively where to find the libraries to extract the symbol names for stack traces. Uh, we don't know how to resolve the events that come from the profiler engine from the kernel. So we go through great lengths to try to make that just work out of the box. Uh, and in doing so, I think that has created a very compelling 
reason to use Builder over other IDEs, despite the fact that our niche is writing GNOME software. And a couple things, like, we do have a lot, there is a lot to keep an IDE fast. Those that have used Eclipse are probably quite familiar how you start typing and a couple seconds later your text shows up. Keeping an IDE fast with you know, thousands of plugins doing random crap uh, presents challenges for the IDE to defend itself against plugins. And we have a bunch of stuff that's happened in there uh, to do that. So that was the challenges of writing the program. Now we have the challenges of, of interacting with the community. And like I said earlier, like everybody wants something out of Builder, and I can't do that for everyone. So again, I need to be the one to enable you to help yourself. Um, one of the things I think has been a good problem to have is as we become more mature, everybody wants us to solve more problems. I think that's like, when you think about the problems you wanna have, that is definitely one of them. Uh, and I expect that to happen more. But that also means that if we are ever going to expand our target audience behind, beyond writing GNOME software, you know, we need a larger contributor base. But, you know, we're not perfect. Uh, you know, the most common request I still get is a tabbed editor, and I may yield. We'll see. Oh. <laughs> well, it would never be default. Um, the abstractions that we made last year for the new editor that allow us to do the, like, the three-finger swipe gesture and all of that, that, having that, the abstraction that we built for that in place makes it considerably easier for me to support both a tabbed and a non-tabbed editor. So, like, I think we're finally getting to a place where I would be okay with that. Uh, we clearly and desperately need better shortcut support and clear shortcut support uh, and allow you to you know, hook up custom commands, et cetera. Uh, the, something that should be exciting, I think, for the next year is this concept of meta project and sub project support. We've gotten people uh, ask for the ability to work on their libraries and their applications at the same time. And so if you think of like the Flatpak manifest being a meta project, it tells us about the dependencies, it tells us where to find them, it tells us what your application is uh, and how to compile them, that we could potentially give you a list of all of the libraries and, and dependencies in the project tree and you could be able to go in there and edit them and build them independently from the project. The difficulty for us is going to be do we take the flat pack approach wherever you change something in the dependency tree, you have to build everything after it? Or do we start taking a hybrid approach of you can modify your library, build it, and just overwrite your previous install of it? Uh, I don't have an answer for that, and I'm sure there's a few people in the room that have uh, some very good input of what we should do. The downside of recompiling everything is every time you touch the library, you could spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes building your dependencies. Uh, afterwards, and then your app again. Uh, we're at the point now where I want to see us get a simulator, and we could eventually turn that into GNOME shell development. We have people saying that writing extensions is incredibly difficult because they don't know how to get their system set up, or they don't know how to work on it without crashing their desktop and then not being able to log back in. So potentially we could set up a, uh, a simulator with GNOME shell, inject your uh, your GNOME shell extension and allow people to, when they hit run, interact with that. When we eventually get to GTK4, we could add a designer, we could add some GitLab workflow stuff. Um, but if you want to influence the order of this list, I highly suggest you come product manage builder and tell me what to do. That position is open. It's not paid, but you get to tell me what to do. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing you can do is if you are happening to be using JHBuild, um, I still do, uh, go ahead and build Builder with this Mason option, be sanitized equals address. It helps keep me honest. You can find if I've made a programming mistake, and I do, so um, that would help me. And there's a bunch of other ways you can contribute to both GNOME and Builder in large. 
And uh, I wrote a blog, a blog post last December about a different, uh, different ways in which you can do that. And I could use all of those in Builder. So if you're interested in doing anything, any aspect, owning some part of the build process, um, the process of building software, in particular Builder, I would love your help. And we have a boff on Tuesday where you can, again, tell me what to do. Uh, so I encourage you to be there. And with that, I will open it up to questions. So I guess this, this comes back to what you were saying about there being lots of different approaches which look very similar to having some kind of sysroot and some kind of compiler and so on. But as I understand it, with you, when you're, there's a support for cross-compiling uh, Flatpak apps, but that's, prob that's using a running the foreign native compiler under QEMU or something. Technically not cross-compiling. Right, it's like, it's, it's like native compiling across like QEMU or something. Whereas you, in, in, in this new model of uh, having, having a sysroot and a cross-compiler, you're, de you're depending on the distro having a cross-compiler for the source target pair that you're interested in available, and then Builder just reuses that. Is there any, like, have you got any, any plans for how you can take the performance advantages of the, of the, of the uh, sysroot plus native cross-compiler approach, sorry, non-native cross-compiler approach, and bring it to the Flatpak world? Do you have an idea? Really good. I'm unsure that I got all of the question. Uh, if your question was, can we use any tool that's available in the system, you can just specify a path for uh, the, the tool. If your question was, can I get the result of it inside the flat pack? It's, it's that's the, 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 the beauty of the, 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 the flat pack cross compilation compilation for foreign architecture support is you don't have to, there's, there's no manual set up. You, you just say like, okay, I want my flat pack to target ARM, go, and as long as you have a, a I guess, QMU static ARM 64, you can do, you can do it. Um, but the compilation will be incredibly slow. Whereas yeah. uh, with, with, with the work you've done, the compilation will be very fast, but there's a lot of native like, manual set up, and like, you've got, you're depending on your distro providing the tools for that. Is there any, do you have any ideas for how you could bring the two together so you get the, the ease of use of the flat pack based um, cr cross compilation, but the performance of your of your of your work. Okay, so ideally, um, I think that the most viable in the future uh, solution will be to be able to cross compile using flat pack, mm -hmm. and just be able to specify a very uh, very specific architecture for your flat pack and uh, use naturally the flat pack SDK that you provide for your specific device. That would be ideal because, uh, yeah, of course, if you try to uh, build Chromium using QMU, it just won't work. So I did. Uh, I posted something on the Flatpak mailing list a couple months ago, and uh, one possible approach I have that we could look into doing this is piggybacking on SDK extensions. Mm -hmm. So if we added a, um, like if I want to compile for Org GNOME platform uh, on ARM 64, uh, I could use the ARM ARCH 64 you know, run to our developer SDK as it is now, and it would just by default do the QEMU uh, static arm like we showed. Um, but if I knew that I could add an org uh, free desktop GCC extension that was named in such a way that I could say like, hey, I need a arm ARH64 GCC extension that runs on x86-64, those SDK extensions can, um, they can uh, affect the path that gets used inside the, uh, inside the container. And so we would, in that case, you'd start getting an LD, a GCC, that would hit earlier in the path on the cross-compiler so that when Mason goes to configure, uh, we would get that. That, I think, is probably the lowest amount of effort work to make this do it, but I don't know whether or not we would consider that the most elegant approach. So yeah, I also investigated this before doing an actual plugin. And so you are indeed able to, you have a 
um, a module endpoints that you can use to add some tools. That's the really missing parts in Flatpak is uh, to be able to say, in fact, this Flatpak is not for this architecture, it's for the other. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have to, there's some missing piece here. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. Cool, I think we're done and we're on time.